So hello everyone, nice to have you back. It's our lunch talk, as Lucas likes to say, winter edition, uh, which I really like. <laughs> winter edition, summer edition, winter edition sounds a bit like cinnamon and um, yeah. So we have two speakers today. I'm very happy. Um, I just say a hi to you and you guys will do the proper introduction. I'm very happy to have Ramona Negron from Leiden University here. And Jessica Den Outsten, Outsten, please excuse my pronunciation. Um, and you both will be talking about slave trade in the 18th century. We are really looking forward to this. And at this stage, I hand over to Lucas, who will introduce you in the proper way. Yes, I too would like to uh, welcome you to this third Prize Papers lunch talk in our lecture series, as Dagmar said, Winter Edition. And I especially welcome the many uh, new guests and mailing list members in our audience today. Uh, today, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce our audience to two wonderful speakers who will give a joint paper on their impressive joint book project. And as you all know, since I'm a big fan of cooperation projects, I must also say that I'm very grateful that the two of you have agreed to uh, speak at the Prize Papers lunch talks together. Uh, your project is highly relevant and shows many overlaps with the collection of the prize papers. It is uh, great to have you here. I've been following uh, your work, as you know, for more than two years now, but due to Corona, I never had the chance, to, apart from a tweet or mail here and there, to actually hear you talk about your research. So it is truly a, a great pleasure to have you during this lecture series. Thanks for joining us today. Before you begin with your lecture, I'd first like to properly introduce you to our audience. Jessica Denautsten is specialized in early modern maritime mi and migration history. Her PhD project, Integration and Social Mobility, the Descendants of Early Modern Immigrants in Amsterdam, 1616 till 1811, addresses one of the major questions in Dutch migration history. What happened to the descendants of the hundreds of thousands of Germans, Flemings, and Scandinavians who migrated to the Dutch Republic in the early modern period? The project zooms in on Amsterdam and focuses on the processes of integration and social mobility of the descendants of early modern immigrants. Jessica studied history at the Erasmus University Rotterdam and Leiden University. She previously worked at Huygens uh, Institute within the project's Dutch prize papers, sailors and Dutch merchant in marine and maritime careers, which you all know. Uh, currently, she also works as data curator at the Amsterdam City Archives within the fantastic project Alle Amsterdamse Akten. Ramona Negron is a PhD candidate working on early modern Dutch firms exploiting the Iberian Empire within the NWO project, exploiting the empires of others, led by Professor Kachan Tunis. Ramona is specialized in early modern maritime history, colonialism, empire, and the history of slavery. She studied history and then colonial and global history at Leiden University. Currently, she also works as an editor for the Historische uh, Tietschrift for Dutch history and as a data curator at the Amsterdam City Archives within the project Alle Amsterdam uh, Akten. The aim of this project is to digitize and index the rich notarial archive of Amsterdam. It's, it's a brilliant project. I must say both your workloads are just impressive. So, uh, yeah, well, together, Mona and Jessica have just published their new book this year, which uh, they will be telling us more about today, called De Große uh, Sklavenhandelerin van Amsterdam, published by Wallbook uh, Purse. I will share the link to this book uh, with you via the chat in a minute. The paper they were presenting today is titled The Amsterdam Private Slave Trade 16. 30 till 1769, sorry. And now the stage is yours. Thank you so much for a wonderful introduction. Uh, it's very nice. Um, we are actually really excited to talk about uh, our project today with you guys. Um, what we would like to do is kind of take you through um, how we began this research, uh, how we did this research and what the kind of main results were um so yeah next slide please okay, i don't think i can do that can you do that jessica <laughs> oh wait oh we try again yeah Yeah, there we go. And then, then yeah, no, yeah. 
Okay, yeah. So first, as I said, um, I'm going to discuss a little bit more um, the research. Um, the main theme of this book, which is a specific slave ship, and then Jessica will talk more about the results. So it all began in the summer of 2020. Um, as um, Lucas already mentioned, we both work as data curators at the Amsterdam City Archives. And at this time, we already did this. Um, and in this project, the Notario Archive of Amsterdam is digitized. And this is done through the work of over 1300 uh, people at their homes. And then our job was to um, kind of check the data they had um, uh, pulled from the, de from the, the deeds. Um, and we were doing this and both of us actually um, randomly, because that's how it works, uh, got a notarial deed. It was a notarized deposition and it was about a slave ship. And the slave ship was called Het gezegende suikerriet, uh, which would translate, I guess, to the blessed sugar cane. Uh, a very interesting name. And um, we both were thinking, well, this, it's, it was a really weird story, actually. Um, and we had like a document of all of these interesting things we came uh, across. So we just pulled it aside and we're like, we'll continue our job. And then a few weeks later, I believe, we both spoke uh, to each other about this slave ship. Um, we didn't know beforehand that we had both encountered this, uh, these depositions. And we thought, well, maybe there's something interesting here. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So what we did is um, we just went to the Amsterdam City Archives website uh, through the index where all the digitized and searchable collections are um, available. And we just started looking for more info, info on um, the slave trader, uh, whose ship this was, um, but also the captain, the crew, um, and we just kept finding things. It was insane, actually. Um, we The whole weekend we were searching and searching, and there was more and more and more. And um, at some point, uh, because we first thought we would write a, li a little article about this, actually, uh, on the website for the Amsterdam City Archives, then we thought, well, maybe a longer article, and then uh, our colleague, uh, Carmen van der Black, told us, why don't you write a book? And we were like, a book? Uh, is it also something we can do? Uh, so we started actually planning this and it turned out to be a book because we had so many data. Um, so we mainly looked firstly um, in the Amsterdam City Archives. Um, we looked also very important at the archives of Suriname. Uh, there's a notarial archive there, but for instance, also the journals of the governor there, Jan Jacob Mauritius. You can see him here, his portrait uh, on the, the slide, um, because he wrote down each day what happened in the colony. And in this journal, we also came across references to the shape, slave ship that we had found. Um, also, the archives of the Dutch East India Company, um, the Dutch West India Company, um, and we came across a lot of information about not only this slave ship in particular, but also about the slave traders involved. And these were um, Jochem Matthijs and Koenraad Smit. And we had heard these names before. We came across them a few times in the, in, through our work actually at the Amsterdam City Archives, but nobody really knew who they were, um, what they were doing, not even if they were brothers or um, nephews or father and uh, son, we had no idea. So we also um, looked further into that. And we actually found that they had a lot of slave ships in the 18th century uh, in Amsterdam. And at some point we started wondering, well, aren't we dealing here with the largest slave traders? Because there were not many others. Um, and this was actually confirmed through an archival find at the archive of the Dutch West India Company. Because after the abolishment of the monopolies of the Dutch West India Company, any slave trader who wanted to um, trade in enslaved people had to request the permission uh, to trade on the African coast. Um, so the Dutch West India Company had a document um, from 1730 to 1760 with all the slave ships that had sailed from Amsterdam to uh, the West African coast and then to the colonies in the West. So we could actually see all of these ships. So then we um, 
um, looked up all of the captains um, and the slave traders, so the owners of the ships. And then indeed it was confirmed that Jochen Matthijs and Kuna Smit were the largest slaveholders or slave traders, I should say, um, of Amsterdam. And also, of, well, partially of the Dutch Republic as well. They really belong to the, the largest slave traders, the private slave traders the Dutch Republic has ever um, known. Uh, so it became more a book about how they, as the largest slave, slave traders in Amsterdam, organized their trade um, through the story of this ship, uh, the Gezegende Suikriet, one of the first slave ships, private slave ships that sailed from Amsterdam um, in the 18th century. Can you go to the next slide? So yeah, what about this ship? Um, the story was pretty interesting. Um, this ship left in November 1743, and what we found were these crews um, giving witness statements about their journey, the voyage. So what had happened on board the ship, um, how the voyage was organized, who were aboard. Um, so it gave really unique insight into how one of the first private slave ships um, sailed to West Africa and to Suriname and kind of the problems they encountered on the way. So the first problem actually was that, and this is actually debated in um, the various uh, sources that we have, some argue that the ship was um, too heavy so it couldn't leave from Tessel, so it had to sail back um, like after a few days. Others say, well, there were all these storms and we couldn't leave. Anyway, there was some sort of problem and they departed again in December, so a month later, to the West African coast. They arrived there in February uh, the next year, so after about uh, two to three months. And they started trading there for actually a pretty long time, um, going through uh, to various fortresses, trading in groups of enslaved people. Um, we know through contact, uh, contracts of uh, the Smiths, um, that they were mostly interested in people, or actually they gave the instruction to their captain to trade in people between the ages of 10 to 20 years old. So basically um, dealing with children here, um, which is interesting because previously historians argued that um, Dutch slave traders were mostly interested in people between 15 and 36, for instance which was based on contracts of the Dutch West India Company, but here you see a very different strategy of uh, private Amsterdam slave traders who were clearly only interested in people between 10 and 20 years old. Um, and they, um, yeah, they started trading there for a while. Um, the instructions were to trade in, or at least sell in Suriname, 320 people. We don't actually know specifically how many people this sh ship had purchased on the West African coast. We know through the journals of the governor in Suriname that 300 arrived there, but um, a few had died, we know, um, but perhaps others had died uh, on the way as well. So we don't know these specific numbers um, going from West Africa to Suriname. Um, the ship had about 30 crew members, which is pretty normal for this time. Um, for actually when you think that most times one crew member um, had to take care of 10 enslaved people. So the ratio is kind of uh, right in this case. And interestingly, it had three captains um, because the first captain, Jan Daniel Schrijver, he dies pretty quickly on the West African coast um, on a little boat that was used to uh, trade in enslaved people. There was some sort of storm and uh, the boat capsized and he, um, yeah, he, he didn't survive this. So then we have a second captain, and this is the first mate, which is also pretty usual, um, these kind of successions on board. And this Deer van der Berg is very problematic because um, he is involved in a lot of abuse in uh, on the ship during the voyage. Um, some of them are actually crew members, um, whose possessions are all of a sudden stolen. Uh, there are stories about this, but more importantly is that he gives a lot of orders to uh, abuse enslaved people on board. And these abuses or these incidents are described in great detail in these depositions. Um, 
of course, the question is always with these kind of sources, how, um, how true are they? Are the stories that are written down, th did they actually happen? The interesting thing here is that we have depositions of crew members who clearly chose the site of this captain, Dirk van der Berg, and kind of defended his actions. And on the other hand, we have actually most of the crew who declare um, that this Dirk van der Berg was a very cruel person. So we could kind of compare these depositions to see if there were differences in what had happened on board. And what we see here is that these abuses are never denied. So even though um, these some of these crew members were kind of friends of Dirk van der Berg and they defended his actions, they always say that these abuses had happened, but some details are a little bit different. Or, and this is actually what they mostly say, is that they say, well, this did this did indeed happen, but um, the people uh, in question, the person in question, did deserve this because it was a punishment because he had stolen something, for instance, or he. Uh, there's actually one woman who had tried to jump overboard and she was punished for this. So they um, do not deny that there was any violence on the ship, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, in this particular journey. So then the ship arrives in February um, 1745 in Suriname, where the enslaved people um, who were still alive were sold. We actually know quite well to which plantations they went because um, a lot of the shareholders of the ship are known because it was, a, as in Dutch we call it, a part today that I. So the ship was owned by Jochen Matthijs and Kuna Smit, but there were investors in the ship. And these investors were mostly planters in Amst in Suriname. Um, so we also looked at who these planters were, which plantations they owned, um, how large these plantations were, what they were uh, cultivating, for instance, coffee or sugar. And so it's very likely that these people were sold to these planters and that in turn, these planters um, delivered uh, coffee and sugar to the ship to go back to Amsterdam. It departed from Amsterdam in May. And interestingly enough, uh, this deer from the Berg is then um, fired by the shareholders in Suriname. So there's a third captain, um, Jonas Rust, and he sails the ship back to Amsterdam and he kind of becomes the new captain. So for a few voyages after he is the captain of the ship. Here there's an overview of um, kind of the main events of the ship. So the departure, um, the arrival in West Africa, the departure there. Um, and um, the ship arrives back in Amsterdam in June or July, so a few months after it had left. And from this time, we see crew members going to the Amsterdam notaries and declaring about uh, the situation on board and the last voyage. Now, this Dirk van der Berg is left behind because the shareholders do not trust this figure on the ship anymore. Um, and they place him on another ship. This ship is um, captured on the way. So Dirk van der Berg only arrives in Amsterdam in January 7th. Uh, 1746. So this gives his uh, his um, employer Jochen van uh, Jochen Matthijs Smit a lot of time to organize uh, a case against him, which will eventually um, yeah uh, happen. Uh, also interesting is that um, Jochen Matthijs has all of his crew members declare about the situation, so that once Dirk van der Berg arrives, um, it is very clear to him what had happened. But actually, Dirk van der Berg is the one who starts um, a process against Jochen Matthijs Smit because he argues that he has um, um, his, his kind of salary, he has to receive that from Jochen Matthijs Smit. Jochen Matthijs Smit argues, well, you, uh, through your uh, command, um, by your command, a lot of people have died on the ship, enslaved people. And these enslaved people were supposed to be sold, so now I have a lesser profit. Uh, so he argues that Jochen, um, or Jochen Matthijs Smit argues that this Dirk van der Berg, his former captain, has to pay him. Uh, so it's a very complicated uh, process. It is, of course, very telling that this process was a civil process. So it was between Dirk van der Berg and Jochen Matthijs Smit. Um, it was not a criminal process. Dirk van der Berg was not prosecuted for the fact that he had uh, murdered people on board. He was solely... Um, in his process with Smith to get his salary. And actually he, well, at some point after a few years, it goes nowhere and they reach an agreement. So um, Jochen Matthijs Smith pays um, part of Dirk van der Berg's salary. So in the end, he does get paid um, for his work. 
Um, I think the next slide is the results. This goes to the next slide. <laughs> it is difficult, it seems. Oh, he's going to restart it, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was not working. I will try again. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. There so, you go. So Ramona told you uh, a lot already, and uh, we have much more to tell. It's actually hard to fit it into uh, uh, the short presentation we do today. Um, that's why I'm focusing on some of the results uh, that we got at the end of our research, uh, not only about Jochem Matthijs uh, Smit, but also uh, the Amsterdam private slave trade as a whole. Yeah, so who were Jochem Matthijs and Konrad Smit? Uh, Ramona already said that it was um, not known by anyone what their relation was. Were they father or, and son or nephews, brothers? Nobody knew. Well, um, the, their names kept popping up in the notarial deeds. So um, it took us some time. They actually made it really hard for us to uh, figure out who uh, was who. Um, because they always signed Jochem Matthijs and Konrad Smit. But in the end, we found that uh, they are actually father and son. So Jochem Matthijs Smit is an immigrant from Germany, uh, from Hamburg, actually. And he is already married when he arrives in Amsterdam to Sophia Katharina Plata. She is from uh, Dresden in Germany. And uh, we do not know the exact date that they arrived in the city. But we do know that, that they uh, registered with the Lutheran Church in 1724. So from the 1720s onwards, we see them appear in the sources in Amsterdam. And they actually have two boys together. Um, one boy, Johan Matthijs Smit, dies at a very young age, but their son Koenraad um, reaches the age of majority and has an active role in the firm. Konrad Smit uh, gets married to Phyllis Hochmeister, who also has a German background. Uh, her father is a German merchant. And what we see is that um, over the several generations, uh, they marry with other Lutheran uh, people. The Lutheran faith is of great importance to them. And um, so Konrad and Phyllis have three children, and one of them is Johan Wilhelm Smit. Um, he is taking over the firm after Konrad dies, and he keeps using the name Jochem Matthijs and Konrad Smit, probably because uh, it was a very well-known name in Amsterdam and he didn't want to change it. So um, although Jochem Matthijs and Konrad uh, are both deceased, uh, Johan Wilhelm still uses uh, the name. And like I already said, uh, the Lutheran faith was of great importance to them. They registered with the Oude Lutherse Kerk. You can see it on the picture on the right. And it was important for both their business and their private life. Um, all the children were baptized in the Lutheran church, but also their business partners, uh, their network consisted of a lot of uh, Lutheran people. For example, the master shipwright who was in um, who built their ships, most of their ships, called uh, Wessel in het Veld. He also had a migration background. His father was from Germany, and um, he was also a member of the Lutheran Church in Amsterdam. So it is likely that they knew each other through the church as well. And then the captains and the crew members were also uh, immigrants, a lot of them. And uh, for the crew members, this is not really remarkable because in the maritime sector in the 18th century Amsterdam, there was also a, always a huge demand for labor. And a lot of immigrants from Germany and Scandinavia um, emigrated to Amsterdam to find uh, work. But it is remarkable that their captains were also immigrants and Lutherans. Um, previous research has shown that um, for example, in Zeeland, where other uh, large uh, slaving, slave traders um, operated from, uh, the captains of these ships were often locals. But for the Smiths, this was not the case. Uh, they had uh, immigrants from Germany and Scandinavia who were their captains. And um, 
some of uh, their, uh, they had a close relationship with these captains, and one of them even uh, baptized uh, that his child uh, with the same name uh, as Jochem Matthijs. So, uh, and Jochem Matthijs Smith was the witness at this uh, bapti ba baptism. So, it shows that there uh, was this close uh, Lutheran uh, network in, from which they operated. Yeah, so um, these are some of the um, results we had in the end. The Dutch West India Company renounces uh, its monopoly on the slave trade between 1730 and 1738. And at that time, Jochem Smit already has an established trading network with plantation owners and officials in Suriname because he is the bookkeeper of uh, multiple merchant marine ships who trade directly with Suriname. And then uh, in the 1740s, 1741 to be precise, he enters the slave trade with the slave ship Africa, which departs from Amsterdam. And a lot of shareholders of these uh, slave ships were in Suriname, and he uh, must have corresponded with them um, and um, had a close relationship. We do not know exactly how he um, came to have this uh, network and how maybe he um, was a pupil of another trader in Amsterdam, or maybe he already had this network when he entered uh, Amsterdam. We do not know what he uh, had done in Hamburg, uh, so that um, we might find that in the future. Um, between 1741 and 1776, the Smiths organized 42 slaving voyages, which transported between 11,000 and 13,000 humans. And uh, that makes them the largest private slave traders of 18th century Amsterdam, as I can show you in the next slide. Uh, because the um, large orange part of the diagram on the right is all Jochem Matthijs and Koenraad Smit. Uh, between 1730 and 1779, there were, uh, uh, there were 32 different slave traders. And as you can see, uh, a lot of them only organized a few voyages. And um, but Jochem Matthijs and Konrad Smit are the only ones who consistently uh, kept organizing slaving voyages over this period. And to give you an indication of the difference, um, Matthijs Freer and Dirk Versteeg were the second largest uh, slave traders and they each organized six voyages, which is of course, a huge difference between the 42 that were organized by Jochem Matthijs and Konrad Smit. And you can see here um, in, the, in the diagram as well that uh, this is the number of slave ships that departed from Amsterdam each year, starting in the 1730s and ending in 1779 when we stopped our research. That's because the Smiths stopped um, with the slave trade, but also because it was the start of the Fourth Anglo-Dutch uh, War, which had a huge impact on the slave trade and temporarily made it stop. And uh, what we found is that a lot of these voyages from Amsterdam were not in the Slave Voyages Transatlantic Slave Trade Database yet, which is uh, a, co a collection of all slaving voyages um, but um, we are planning to add these in the near future. So our data makes uh, the image of the Dutch uh, slave trade more complete. And especially for the earlier voyages uh, from 1730 to 1733, there were a lot of voyages that were not known yet. And as you can see, the blue is Jochem Matthijs and Konrad Smit, and they are actually very consistent with um, organizing one or two voyages each year. So, um, yeah, like I said, we stopped in 1779, but the um, notarial archives uh, give an opportunity to researchers to uh, expand on this research, uh, to do a lot of more, um, to find a lot of more information on slave trade, private slave trade in Amsterdam specifically. Uh, there is a lot of information in these notarized depositions on what happened on board. We also found that for other um, private slave traders already. So we know the information is there and we are certain that in the next few years, a lot more information on slavery and slave trade will uh, surface in this uh, past notarial archives. 
And then of course, um, I know the price paper collection, like Lucas already said, and I know what is in there. And I'm sure that um, there's also a lot of information on private slave trade and slavery in there as well. I already found um, a letter from a slave trader in Zeeland, and he was also connected to Jochen Matthijs and Konrad Smit financially. So it's really um, um, just a matter of time until we find more information uh, on these figures. And we haven't been able to find a letter to or from Jochen Matthijs and Konrad Smit yet, but given that they were trading for several decades and their ships were going back and forth between Suriname, um, I think it's only a matter of time before uh, a letter might uh, resurface again. So thank you all for listening. And a lot more can be uh, read in our book. It's uh, only uh, for the moment in um, Dutch. But who knows uh, what will happen uh, in the future, we might have an English translation as well.